Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our uh, Palm Sunday service here for 2020. Um, boy, oh boy, we're already in the month of April. We're glad you're, you're with us during this pandemic time and we're all online. So I hope you're cozied up and uh, ready to worship with us today. Uh, we just welcome you. Just a few quick announcements before we begin. Uh, first of all, we are gonna be having communion during this service. So at the end, uh, I mentioned this last week, so I hope you have some elements ready, some grape juice or wine, some bread, and we'll celebrate Holy Communion right near the end of the service today. Also, we will be having a Good Friday service that'll take place also at 10.45 a.m., right the same link that you've been clicking on for these services. That will also be a communion service. So Good Friday communion service, very special, and important time. I hope you can join us for that. And then of course, Resurrection Sunday, two days later, we'll be having uh, an online service of that as well. Same time, 10.45. I want to thank you for those of you who've been, uh, particularly in our church family, who've been continuing to give, and some of you also have been giving through our website. We're grateful for that. Continue to support your local church if you're from another community and you belong to another church. Uh, continue to support your church. That's so important, but we do appreciate your giving at this time. It's helping us meet our needs uh, during the pandemic situation that we find ourselves in. Um, let's begin today with a time of worship. Let's bring our hearts and our voices before God. Let's sing to him.
You know, it's so important for us uh, in this context of worship, to, as our hearts are open before God, to give attention to his word. And uh, a lot of you have been finding a lot of hope and solace in Psalm 91. What a great portion of scripture. I call Psalm 91 one, our 911 verse of the Bible uh, because uh, the great promise is there. But I want to read to you Psalm 91 today. Hope this is something that you'll turn to several times, maybe even daily. I'd encourage you to read it maybe first thing in the morning uh, and the last thing you do before you go to bed at night during this whole pandemic, just claiming these promises of Psalm 91. Listen to what it says here. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he shall give his angels charge over you to guard you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot. The Lord answers, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. What a great promise from God's word. And I hope you'll dwell a lot in Psalm 91. It's worth it. Like I said, you might want to start your day with it and, and end your day with it and get those, those great verses from Psalm 91 in your spirit. Let's uh, pause to spend a few minutes here in prayer, a few moments here in prayer before we have our message today. So much to pray about in our world today. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for the promise of protection that you've given us in your word, particularly this passage of scripture, Psalm 91. Lord, we do want to dwell in the secret place of the Most High, because there we find shelter and comfort and protection, even from this pandemic that's plaguing our world. Father, we pray for those who are affected by this, those who are in hospitals and have tested positive and are on respirators and others who have symptoms of it, not sure if they've got it. Father, we speak a word of healing over those who are affected by this, protect their families that they're, they've been in contact with. We pray for frontline workers in our hospitals and medical places, people in retail, Lord, who are dealing with the general public and, and uh, just people in long-term care facilities in particular, trying to uh, ma maintain a place of uh, protection for those people there. Oh God, would you just cover all at this time? We pray for those affected economically with closures and um, suspensions of, of work. Father, many are affected by this. We pray, Lord, that you will provide for those who have a need during this time. Lord, we trust in you, but we don't want to turn away from you uh, during this time. It might be a temptation for us to get frustrated or get discouraged, and, and we would do the one thing we should never do, which is to turn away from you. Lord, we want to learn from this passage of scripture we're going to look at today. A woman who just adored you and loved you and knew enough to come to you, even at the most difficult times of her life. Father, we want to do that. We want to follow her example. Would you just teach us from your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read to you a passage uh, that might be very well known to some of you. It's, um, it's from John chapter 12. It's about a woman in scripture who just showed incredible love for Jesus. Um, a couple of the other gospels, Matthew and Mark, also record this. A same passage, the same incident. They don't give this lady's name, but uh, John's gospel does give her name. Let's pick it up here in John chapter 12. I'm going to read the first eight verses. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. 
Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put into it. But Jesus said, Let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Wow, this is a powerful portion of scripture, and there's much that we can learn from it. I kind of want to focus today on where is your heart? What are the things that you love? You know, when we really love somebody, it should be able to be obvious to the person that we're loving. They should know that they are the object of our affection. Uh, Jesus is at this home, and this woman comes in. It's Mary, a little bit more on her uh, later in this message, but she lavishes her love on her Savior. Have you ever been in a situation where um, someone just, they wanted to show you how much you know, they loved you or meant to you, and so they gave you a very extravagant gift. You knew that, it, that the gift was very, very extravagant to them. And you may have even been like, oh, please don't do this. I'm not worthy of this. Or, uh, you know, you may have even uh, tried to deter them. They said, no, I, this, you mean so much to me. I, I want to give you this gift. This happened to me a few years ago. There was a, a man that I met in ministry, and we did some preaching together, actually. And he has, uh, he's been in different parts of the world, actually, ministering. But uh, we're still very good friends to this day. And, and one day he called me up and said, I have something for you, Brian. I, 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 I have something I want to give you as a, a sign of our deep friendship. So he, he came for a visit and um, he presented me with this watch. It wasn't the most expensive watch in the world. Uh, I don't know that it was a Rolex or whatever. I'm not sure what brand it was. But it was a very meaningful watch to him. It was a family heirloom to him and his family. And someone had passed it on. It may have been his father. I'm not sure who, but he, he was wearing the watch. He took the watch off and he gave it to me. Now, I'm not wearing that watch. I'm, wa I'm wearing a very inexpensive black watch. I can't wear this watch. It's too valuable to me. I have it in a very safe and special place in my home. But he said, I, I tried to say, oh, listen, this is a family. That, please don't give this to me. He said, no, no, no. I, your, your friendship means so much to me. I, I want you to know how much it means to me. It's so valuable to me that there's no... There's no commodity on this earth that, that would compare to the relationship we have in the Lord as brothers in the Lord. And so he gave me this. And to this day, it's a very, very cherished thing for me. The woman in the story today, Mary, is part of a family that Jesus knew in the city of Bethany. Uh, her brother, Lazarus, her sister, Martha, the three of them were good friends of Jesus. And Jesus just meant the world to her. Um, I want to give you a phrase that Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 21. And he says it to us. He said this in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. See, when we put our money into something, we're saying that's where our treasure is. That's what we value in life. We, we spend money on all sorts of different things. Think about the stuff that you have right now. Do you have a fancy car? Do you have a cottage? Do you have nice clothes? What, what do you spend your money on? Jesus is saying, where your treasure is, where your money is, that's where your heart is. If I'm reluctant to part with my money towards something, it proves my heart is not in that thing. Mary wanted Jesus to know, and she let everyone else know that day too, my heart belongs to Jesus. He's everything in, in my world. What a, what a person does with their money reveals what is inside their heart. It shows what they truly love. Let's just take a look at this passage for a few minutes, shall we? What is this gift? What was this extravagant gift that Mary gave to her Savior to show her incredible love for him? The Bible says that she came there into the house and she took a pound of very costly oil of spike. Now, remember, it was a Roman pound, which is 12 ounces. That's a lot of perfume for this. This is a a spikenard was uh, an essence, a perfume that was extracted from like a rare plant that grows in northern India. And it was a very meticulous extraction process to get it into uh, the form that it would have been in perfume. Um, and 
uh, it's usually held in a very expensive container. The other passages in Mark 14 verse 3, it says that it was an alabaster vase, which was like a, a, a white gypsum material. And um, it would have been something that would be able, been able to hold this perfume and preserve it for many, many years. Um, so she brought this alabaster vase. The alabaster vase had a funny shape to it too. It was kind of a, a, a sort of a typical vessel uh, and it had a, go a long curved goose neck. And the reason it had that was so that you could only get one drop of this perfume out at a time. The reason was you only need one drop or two maybe. The, the essence was very strong. It was a very distinct and very pleasant aroma. Uh, it was expensive. This was rare. This is not your dime store type of perfume. I remember, oh my goodness, my poor father, uh, years ago when we were little for Christmas, my brothers and I, I we would go to the Byway store. If you're over 50, you know what the Byway store was and, and just uh, the home of cheap stuff. And we would buy my dad soap on a rope and high karate cologne. And we thought we were giving him this fantastic thing. We'd scrounge up money from our piggy bank and we'd go and buy this stuff. And and God bless my dad. He he used the soap on a rope in the shower. He put on the high karate clone. As I think back on it now, who do I feel more sorry for? My dad wearing the clone or my mom who had to smell it? I don't know. But anyway, this was not high karate clone. This was very expensive. If people smelled oil of spikenard, they knew that, wow, somebody's got something valuable. I think you didn't smell this everywhere. But she didn't take a few drops and put it on Jesus. She broke that goose neck and poured all 12 Roman ounces, the entire package, over Jesus' feet. Wow. That is a pedicure that no one has ever gotten before or since. I imagine that people in the room there were like muttering, not just Judas. Judas kind of, he plays his hand, so we read it here. But I bet you there were others that thought, what's the lady doing? My goodness, does she not know that... This would have been a family heirloom, this, this spike nard. Mary probably inherited this alabaster vase of perfume from her mother, who got it from her mother, who got it from her mother. It would have been passed down through several generations. You don't use it up that quickly because you only use a drop or two at a time, and you, it wasn't for common use. It, for special occasions, wedding, feast, or some other thing, um, it was very rarely used. Uh, so when you did smell it, 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 you knew that something important was happening. She's poured out the entire thing on Jesus' feet. Judas here says, uh, he lets us know how much this was worth. He says, uh, could this fragrant oil not have been sold and for 300 denarii and given to the poor? 300 denarii, a denarius was about 18 cents. Doesn't sound like much, but back in New Testament times, that was a, a general laborer's day wage. So it was like 300 days wages or basically a year's wages that she dumped on Jesus' feet. And um, it's interesting. I want us to compare these two people, Judas and Mary. They have very different motives about their love for Jesus. You know that Jude Judas was one of the 12 that was handpicked by Jesus. He prayed all night, the Bible says. And when he was finished praying, he came down from the mountain and he chose 12 of his disciples whom he designated as apostles. One of those was Judas Iscariot. So he was in a very privileged position to be walking with the master and to be learning from him and, and to be um, chosen to, to have this ministry. And yet his heart was not with Jesus. Judas's motivation was greed. You know, it says right there in verses 4 to 6, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him. Remember, John is writing this after the fact, years later when he wrote his gospel under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, why would, he quotes Judas, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put into it. His motive was greed. He wasn't there to lavish love on Jesus. He liked being the treasurer of the apostles. He liked being uh, able to have easy access to the money purse and helped himself to it you know, and did whatever he wanted with it for selfish purposes. His heart did not belong to Jesus. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. Judas's treasure was in himself. He helped himself to the money bag. So that's where his heart was. His heart was in himself. He was a very selfish person. Mary is quite the opposite. 
Her motivation is love. She came to Jesus at the, ta the table, by the way, where he would have been sitting at would have been like a U-shaped table and it would have been a low table. They sat on low couches, not like a table, like a dining room table you and I would have. They would sort of recline with their feet back. And so she would have come up behind him and annoyed her his feet with this, broke this, this goose neck, poured all the alabaster contents of the spike nard on his feet. And then it says that she wiped the feet his feet with her hair, verse three. The house is filled with the fragrance of the perfume. She would have let her hair down in public, which was a, a very humiliating thing. So she was humbling herself. She didn't care what other people thought. Her, her motivation was, I, I love this man, Jesus. When we look at Mary, we find that she's always at the feet of Jesus. There's three times in scripture where Mary is mentioned. And so what is it with Mary's fascination with the feet of Jesus. Why is that an important place for her to be? I want to read you a verse from the Old Testament in Isaiah 52, verse 7. The prophet Isaiah said this, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Isaiah said, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of of him who brings good news. Jesus is the essence of, of one who brings good news. The Bible says the feet of the one who brings good news are beautiful. Mary takes that quite literally. She says, I want to I wanna honor you, Jesus. Your feet walk to villages where there are people who are blind and deaf and lame, and you touch them and heal them. Your feet walk to the, through the uh, entrance to the temple and you teach the people in the Sabbath the oracles of God. Your feet walk through dusty villages and minister to the people, the poor and the, and, and the destitute. You have beautiful feet. I want to honor those feet. Jesus had traveled to this home. There's usually, when you come to someone's home, there's some, a servant usually is at the door and washes the feet if it's a, if a, a well-to-do family. Uh, or else the person does it themselves. But usually there's a basin there and, and a towel and you can wash your feet because, you know, roads there weren't paved. And so Jesus' feet probably, you know, were a little bit dirty, a little bit dusty. She anoints them with all this fragrant perfume, which immediately filled the whole room. By the way, his feet would have had this uh, aroma to them for the rest of that day and probably the next day. I mean, this is uh, uh, was an incredible spa treatment she gave his feet. And then she let her hair down and wiped his feet with her hair. Incredible humility on her part, not caring what other people thought. But two other places. In Luke's gospel, we know that Jesus one time on his travels ended up at the home of Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus. And uh, he was there and, and there was a meal prepared for them. And you may be familiar with that passage. But while Martha, the older sister, was preparing the meal, she got kind of upset by the fact that Mary wasn't helping her. But, but Luke 10 verse 39 tells us something. It's, and it tells us something about Mary. It says, and she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus's feet and heard his word. You see, Mary was a disciple, a learner. She wanted to learn from the master. She sat at his feet. That was the posture that uh, a disciple took when they were listening to their mentor or their master. They sat at the, at the master's feet. And it was a posture that told them that my master is above me. He has things to teach me that I need to learn to improve my life. And so they sit at his feet. That expression is used a lot of people that so-and-so sat at the feet of, you know, you, you might read this throughout the Bible. And it's, it's an idiom, but it also means that, you know, there's a, there's a posture of humility with that. This is where Mary was. Mary said, Jesus is in my home. I want to take advantage of this. She sat at his feet to learn from him. Just prior to this incident here, Lazarus had died. Her brother had died. Jesus was in a different town when this happened. Word came to him. He waited four days because he knew what he was going to do. He was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. We don't have time to read that, but you can read that later. It's in John chapter 11. It's a good chapter to read. So Jesus comes, Lazarus has been dead, they were already, he was already put in the tomb, his body had been prepared, a stone was rolled against the tomb, um, so it looks like it's too late. Of course, we know that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, but while he's coming there, someone tells Mary, Jesus is coming. And so let me pick it up there, or John chapter 11, verse 32. 
Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary knows this is a terrible situation. Her brother's died. She's in the throes of grief. She and Martha and the rest of their family, the people from their village, it's just an awful thing. But then Jesus arrives. She has this idea, you know, something as bad as this is, I know where to go to. She goes out and meets him and immediately falls at his feet. She's seeking the comfort and the strength that only Jesus can provide. She knows where to go. And the reason is because her heart is with Jesus. She loves this man more than anyone else on the, on the earth. And then, of course, the third one was our text today in, in John chapter 12. She seals the deal, as it were. If she hadn't proven her love and her devotion to Jesus in the other previous uh, two occurrences, certainly, to a great magnitude, it's proven here when she poured out this expensive perfume. She left uh, nothing to chance here. Anyone there would have known, wow, uh, for a woman to have done this, uh, man, that's she must really love him. And it's there's this phrase that Jesus says after there's the criticism, uh, other uh, the, the other accounts of this talk about other people criticizing her about you know the money being spent doesn't say Judas right away. It says that there were the, some there. We know that Jesus, Judas was the one that said it, but there may have been others that at least thought it if they didn't say it. But Jesus says something incredible, which gives us a link to Mary's insight and her uh, the depth of her devotion. Jesus said, after there was a criticism about how much this money was, was and that she wasted it, Jesus says in verse 7, Let her alone, she has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Jesus is not disregarding the poor. He's taught in other places. He himself ministered to the poor. He fed them when they were hungry and ministered to them in so many different ways throughout the gospel account. So he's not disregarding the poor here. He's saying, you're missing something. Your life should revolve around me. I should be at the center of your life. I have everything you need for your life. This woman gets it. The rest of you, you're still, you're still kind of on the outside looking in. Mary knows this. He said to her, he said about her, she has kept this for the day of my burial. You know, the burial customs in the Middle East, you know, when a person died, it, it's not like funeral homes now where there was an embalming type of thing. The, it was an outer thing. They, they would anoint a body with spices and, and fragrant perfumes, this type of thing. And then they would put them in the grave. Uh, it was usually um, a, a sort of a, a dugout, like in the ground, and, and they would roll a stone against it. And, and uh, that would be a burial plot. And so um, this is why there was a concern when Lazarus was being raised four days later that his body would smell because of that hot climate. So he said, she's already anointed my body for burial. That was a foreshadowing that Jesus would be dying for his people, Mary included. What a powerful thing for him to say. Jesus knew and appreciated the lavish, extravagant love that Mary showed for her Savior. You know, we're coming into this Easter season. This is a perfect time of year for us to be really thinking more and more about the passion of Jesus, what he went through in that last week of his life. By the way, the last week of Jesus' life takes up most of the gospel material even though it was only one week of his life out of the 33 years that he lived. This is a very good time of the year for us to be considering where our treasure is. You know, so many things that we uh, have invested in this, this world. It's been tested here during this uh, COVID-19 crisis with people losing jobs or at least being suspended or laid off. Companies having to close down. Um, retail being affected, our stock markets uh, being affected greatly. And all of a sudden people are thinking, you know, can I hang on? And we were showing playing our hand, as it were, where our investment is. You know, as followers of Jesus Christ, we should say, you know something? These are important things. I need to take care of them as much as I can. But my relationship with Jesus is the most important thing in my life. That I can't live without. I want you to be thinking about that. We're going to celebrate the Lord's table here in just a few minutes. I hope you'll have your elements ready. And, and um, let's appreciate what Jesus gave to us. As much as Mary poured out her most expensive, her most extravagant possession and gave it all, every drop of it, to the one she loved, the Lord Jesus, Jesus gave every drop of the most expensive ointment he had, his very blood on the cross of Calvary. It's worth a lot more than oil or spike nard or any other essence on the face of this earth. It's worth way more than that. Let us pray. 
Father, we thank you for this passage. We're thankful for the example of Mary and what she did to show her extravagant love for her Savior and our Savior. And Lord, as we prepare ourselves to take communion today, take of the elements of the bread, which represents Jesus' broken body, and the cup, which represents his shed blood, we are reminded that Jesus himself poured out and lavished and wasted his most precious essence on us. May we appreciate that in a deeper and a fresher way today. And may it propel us into this week ahead as we look ahead to, to Holy Thursday and Good Friday and then Resurrection Sunday. May you cause these things, as we reflect on them from Scripture, to deepen our relationship with Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's go and celebrate the Lord's table now, shall we? Welcome, friends, to the Lord's table. The Lord Jesus welcomes you to his table uh, to remember his body and his blood, to remember the sacrifice he made at the cross of Calvary on that very first Good Friday, and we're getting close to celebrating that later this week. Uh, he invites you, if you know Christ as his Savior, to partake of the elements today. I hope you have those prepared in your home, wherever you are, and, and uh, we have some here. And um, just want to share a few things. Let's hear something from God's Word first in Luke chapter 22. Luke recording for us what Jesus said the night of the, his betrayal, that Seder meal that, that you and I call the Lord's Supper when it was instituted, part of the Passover celebration the Jews observed. Starting at uh, 22 verse 14 of Luke's Gospel, When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said this, sorry, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly, the Son of Man goes it is as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Wow, powerful words. You know, we should prepare our hearts before we have the Lord's table. Anytime you take of the elements, this is not a casual thing. This isn't some rote, routine thing. This is a very important act of worship before the Lord. God has given us this institution called the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, to remember him. And so I want to read something that goes really well with the message we just heard from John's Gospel about the woman, Mary, who lavished her love on Jesus with the alabaster vial of, of spikenard. You know, she poured out its essence. It was broken and spilled out. As a matter of fact, that's the name of the song, Broken and Spilled Out. Uh, it's, it's sung by Steve Green, if you want to Google that on the internet. Um, it's, it's written by Bill George and Gloria Gaither. I'm not going to read the whole song, uh, but it goes to the story of, the, of, of Mary and her lavish gift on Jesus that day in the home in Bethany. But I want to read you the portion of the, uh, that applies here to the Lord's table. Lord, you are God's precious treasure, his love and his own perfect son, sent here to show me the love of the Father, just for love it was done. And though you were perfect and holy, you gave up yourself willingly. You spared no expense for my pardon. You were used up and wasted for me, broken and spilled out, just for love of me, Jesus, God's most precious treasure lavished on me. You were broken and spilled out and poured at my feet. In sweet abandon, Lord, you were spilled out and used up for me. In sweet abandon, let me be spilled out and used up for thee. I like how that song ends because there's an onus on us as we receive these elements and appreciate what Jesus Christ did for us at the cross of Calvary, that we then go from this table and we are broken and spilled out for a world that needs Jesus desperately. Let's hear the words of institution as the Apostle Paul recorded them for us in the book of 1 Corinthians. He says there, he records, On the night he was betrayed, the Lord took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, 
which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father, as we take this bread today, we're reminded of the crucified body of Jesus that bore our sickness and carried away our diseases, and by his stripes we are healed, including from this pandemic, this COVID-19 crisis. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that your body was crucified cruelly on the cross of Calvary. We take this bread in remembrance and appreciation for your crucified body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take and eat together, shall we? In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. Again, he gave thanks. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray again. Lord, we hold this, this cup, this grape juice or wine, an emblem to remind us of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And just as Mary that day poured out every drop of that expensive oil of spikenard perfume on the feet of Jesus to lavish her love on him, so, Lord Jesus, you poured out every drop of your precious blood down the cross of Calvary to lavish your love on us, to take all our sins away at the cross of Calvary. We appreciate, we give you thanks for that. We are we're, we stand in awe that we should be forgiven of all our sins because of what Jesus did. We take this cup today in remembrance that, Jesus, you died for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's take and drink together. That concludes our communion service. I hope you have a blessed day and a blessed week. As we go into the Passion Week, spend lots of time in prayer this week. Spend lots of time in your Bible. Focus on the Lord and uh, look forward to meeting again with you on Good Friday, 1045 a.m. Remember to have the communion elements ready again. We're going to have a communion service for Good Friday, time of somber and solemn reflection on the things of God. Let's go forth, though, from this table. Remember, we need to be broken and spilled out for him. There's a world out there that needs us. Let's go with his blessing. Let's pray. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.